So this is the second uh, installment of the Adriatology seminar. Today it's my turn. And as I, uh, <clears throat> as we said the other time, usually this will be like this, that every talk has uh, two parts, four to five minutes each. One is supposed to be a little bit more generally understandable, although we'll have to see whether this is successful. And the other one is, uh, you know, about current research. And so, uh, <clears throat> so now there's my talk for the part which you are supposed to possibly understand the stable schools of quantum surfaces, and then I do a certain computation. So, <clears throat> okay, uh, if you're ready, we, we can start. So, we talk about stable schools of quantum surfaces. So, this is rather, uh, can you see it like this, or does one have to lower the light or something? Is it okay? Maybe we can lower the light. Uh, if one can, yeah. So, how would one do that? Like this. Well, not everything we know. If it's in the dark, it falls. Okay, is that okay like that? Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's start. So, we look at S smooth projective surface. Sn is the Hilbert scheme of n points in S. So, this will parameterize the elemental sub scheme of degree n on S. So, a general element. Uh, response to n distinct points on S, and when some of these points come together, uh, we have a non reduced scheme structure at that point. And so, why uh, this uh, space is smooth projective of dimension 2 times n? <clears throat> so, why should one care about it? One thing, by looking at the ideal sheets of the sub schemes, when it is a, an example of the modelized space. Of sheaves on the surface and somehow the simplest such example one can think of. And uh, with this, it becomes a model case for anything one might want to study about such modular space of sheaves. And uh, somehow all the theorems one might want to prove are there in the simplest uh, version in that case. Then, if one wants to look at modular space, for instance, of higher rank sheaves, <coughs> uh, one can use the silver schemes of also the ideal sheaves of zero dimensional sub schemes as somehow the building blocks. So one can somehow try to understand other modular spaces in terms of them. Then uh, another thing is that uh, it's an important example of higher dimensional varieties. You know, so for instance, if uh, the surface is a KQ surface, then Sn is a hypercalar manifold or irreducible, irreducible homomorphic syntactic. Uh, <coughs> And these are rather, such varieties are rather rare. And so we, one of the main ways of getting them is the Hilbert scheme of points. And there, it's also a very nice structure which one can use to study these spaces very well. And then naturally, Hilbert schemes of points have been multiple applications. Somehow one can use them to count the points in special configurations, but also and then indirectly curves and other things. So that's. Uh, no, one more thing. So there is some kind of inductive structure to look at all the Hilbert schemes together. Just a kind of trivial uh, thing. So if you have a zero dimensional subscheme on of length n and you have a point which lies outside the zero dimensional subscheme, if you take the union, this is a subscheme of length n plus one. So that means we have a rational map. From S times the Hilbert scheme of n points to the Hilbert scheme of n plus one points, just taking the union. And uh, this gives us some kind of inductive structure how one can go from one Hilbert scheme to the next and somehow understand them recursively. And, uh, for instance, from this, but also from other things, if one wants to compute some invariance of the modelized spaces, one could hope that it's natural to make a generating function instead of in terms of this n. And for instance, this recursive structure should allow you to find some. So hope we have a nice generating function. And uh, uh, you could also hope to have some algebraic structures which uh, put together whatever all the cohomologies of the spaces of the cycle. So let's see. Now maybe I can go back again to the definition to the Hilbert scheme of points. So I'm trying to see zero dimensional subschemes of degree n on S. As I said, the general point 
the set of n existing points on S in the smooth projective of dimension to n. And uh, yeah, it's related, you know, there are simpler ways how you can prioritize sets of n points, which possibly come together. You can just take account, count, take n points counted with multiplicity. This is what the symmetric power does. Just you take the actual part of the surface, you divide by the action of the symmetric group. Uh, this will parameterize, as I said, n points with one. This you can also write this as an effective zero cycle. So some ni xi, where the xi are distinct points in S, and the sum of here and i is n. And there is a the Hilbert Charmorphism, which relates the Hilbert scheme to the symmetric power, which just sends a subscheme to the support with multiplicities. So that means to every point uh, which lies in the support of the subscheme, you associate the uh, dimension as a vector space of uh, the local ring of the subscheme of that point. The sum of these is n. And this map turns out to be a resolution of singularities. So it's easy to see that J points the, the symmetric power, the second symmetric power will be singular along the diagonal, and the, uh, in this case, uh, yeah, this is uh, this uh, similar result, and it uh, has a special property that if you take the canonical class, which was mentioned in the previous lecture when we were talking about classification of higher dimensional varieties, um, which plays a big role for the classification, uh, <coughs> this behaves very well with respect to this. So the canonical class of the Hilbert scheme is a pullback of that of the uh, of the symmetric power, and in fact. This implies that the rational properties of the Hilbert scheme of points are very close related to that of S. This is S is rational in the Hilbert scheme is, and the Kodaya dimension, which tells you in some sense how complicated uh, the manifold is from the uh, birational point of view, is just of the Hilbert schemes n times that of the surface. Okay. So now it can give some just the most stupid examples. So for instance, what's the Hilbert scheme of zero points? So zero points is just the empty set. So it doesn't mean the, Hil the Hilbert scheme is zero, is empty, but it consists of one point, and this point parameterizes the empty set. And uh, the, the Hilbert scheme of one point is S, because obviously S parameterizes the point of S. And then if we look at the Hilbert scheme of two points, <coughs> you know, a two-dimensional uh, sub-scheme of length two is either two distinct points, or it is a it's one point with a non-reduced structure of length two. We can easily see that this corresponds to a tangent direction for the surface at that point. And so you get this when you have uh, that these are given by a projective bundle over the surface. And if you work this out, you can see that the, the second table scheme is just you take the product of x with itself, you blow it up along the diagonal. And then you take the quotient by the action uh, by this by you know commuting the two factors as of S2, which leads to okay. So this is this is really the subject. So uh, <clears throat> so Sn is also is a modular space, a fine modular space or parameter space of the zero dimensional subschemes. So uh, we have the universal family. Sorry, what do you mean by exchanging the factors? Do, do you do it before or after involving? Well, one can prove that's equivalent. So you can either first, you, know, you if you you exchange, if you you can exchange the factor, the action leads to to the blow up. Uh, no, and uh, you can, but you can also say you take the the quotient by 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 this action, take the singular thing. If you blow up the diagonal in that, you also get this. So it, it doesn't matter in which order. You um, so, so you can just say the, this universe subscheme is just an incident for the bond between points and subschemes in S times Sn. And this really is a universal subscheme. So, if you have any flat family of subschemes in the surface, uh, which of, of, of length n, then uh, this corresponds you know, over some base, this corresponds to a map. Uh, from the base to the Hilbert scheme, uh, such that the pullback of the universal family via this map will be uh, the family of uh, subschemes that we're getting. And this is done in such a way, obviously, that 
the fiber over a point which corresponds to subskin is that subskin. So somehow the blockchain comes is used in protection, obviously from S to the other scheme and from the server. So <clears throat> we can use this thing to define topological sheaves, which are kind of basically uh, or topological bundles, which are bundles which uh, one uses for essentially any application of favorite schemes. Uh, so if we're given a vector bundle on the surface, see a frame S or frank R, we can associate with the vector bundle of rank R times N on the Hilbert scheme of N points. So this is done by you know first pulling back from the surface to the um, to the to the universal family and then pushing down to the Hilbert scheme. Practically that means we take H0 of this fiber. So the, the fiber of the uh, so the, the, the fiber of the uh, this topological uh, sheet over the point corresponding to the sub scheme is just somehow H0 of the spectral bundle restricted to the sub scheme. And so, in particular, in this case, uh, for the trigger bundle, it is just that, which is the same as taking the structure sheet of the sub scheme viewed as a vector space. Okay. Um, and in particular, we also can take the determinant of such bundle. Uh, this will be a, a line bundle on the, on the Hilbert scheme, and these determinant bundles generate the whole of the PCAR group. So we know all the line bundles on the Hilbert scheme so far. Okay. Now, I want to give some results about the Hilbert scheme. Most of them are kind of ancient, but uh, uh, you know, it's just an overview of uh, what to use or what. Uh, what one can do with them. So I start with uh, my first encounter with the, the, with them, uh, which uh, so these Hilbert schemes, as the Hilbert schemes, as I said, for different n are so close related, one can expect some life generating functions for the topological band. For instance, we can look at the Betty numbers. <coughs> um, the Betty numbers are the dimensions of the uh, homology groups. Or the homology groups, uh, the Fermi polynomial is the corresponding sum of the Becky number, and the Euler number is the coordinating sum of the Becky numbers, or which is the same as the Fermi uh, polynomial, or the variable equal to minus one. And then we have this whole uh, formula that. Does it I go to zero to two times convention groups? Uh, well, okay, that's true. I mean, if you have complex, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the dimension of Riley, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 yeah, that's uh, that's a mystery. Yeah, so, I mean, I could say at this moment that they are taking the dimension, but that would be cheating because they certainly didn't need them. Okay, so then one gets this uh, somewhat amazing formula, the generating function. So we have here a formula for all the vector numbers of all the Hilbert schemes uh, as this infinite part. So you can see into this product, we get uh, the petty numbers of the surface. So this one plus C, D minus one to D one, like this. And you can see the side function. <coughs> so we can see a few things. So, so we can see a few things. For instance, the petty numbers of the, of the Hilbert scheme only depend on the petty numbers of the surface. You know, the polynomials the petty number of the surface if you multiply this out. <coughs> In the same way, you have here the formula of all the other law, which happens by putting d equal to minus one, and if you become the computation, then you get this. Uh, but you can also see that you have this incredibly nice structure, which obviously uh, in the formula which somehow should indicate that there's something more going on than just you have a nice generating function, but there should be some algebraic structure which ties all the homology groups, all the Hilbert schemes together. And uh, this is indeed. Uh, the case, and so what? Yes. That's a long form. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is very. Uh, I mean, it yes, but still, one can't read it. One can't see it. <laughs> Even if it's well known, also n equals k. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not to, so. Misprints are always good. I mean, you can also have the the, the, the slides afterwards. It's not like no, no, no. I can't understand. Well, I hear it. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Okay, so that would be a little bit hard because later there will be very many formulas, and <laughs> I think in the second half. So if you can copy those, you are uh, uh, okay. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. So we put all these uh, homology of all the different states together. So they put Fn to be uh, the homology of the n-tailed scheme. Take the direct sum of all of them, and then like I remarked uh, many years ago, that uh, this space F is the uh, is an irreducible representation of the Heisenberg algebra H model on the homology of uh, of S. Uh, so it's a corresponding box space representation. And so what is this uh, Heisenberg algebra? So it's an uh, integer natural D algebra generated by the by some operators P and of alpha so n is an integer alpha is a homology class. The ones with positive n we call the creation operators, the one with negative n the annihilation operators. And we have the this uh, Heisenberg algebra relation that so most of the time these operators commute. Uh, they only don't commute when n is equal to minus n, and then uh, what we get as a uh, commutator is, uh, so to speak, uh, this uh, s times. Uh, so the evaluation of the product of alpha and beta on the fundamental graph of s times n times minus one to n minus one. So this is uh, this thing, and uh, now h. X on F, namely, if I'm not mistaken. So if I if I class you apply PM of alpha to beta, uh, where beta lies in the homology in, of the n table scheme, uh, then I get a class in the n plus n table scheme for n uh, A. So this is a star, it's not a key. So uh, just uh, Roughly, the idea is if you you can think of representing a cohomology class by a submanifold, um, and then what this would mean is that if the n if this n is positive, and this is the class of uh, we have a certain submanifold corresponds to A, then we add to uh, we take classes. Where we, we add to the class which we had before, uh, the cohomology class correspond in the Hilbert scheme corresponding to uh, you know, schemes of length n which are supported on this submanifold. So you take the, and the, the other one is the p minus m is essentially the, the joint operator for, with respect to the intersection pair. Okay, so, <clears throat> and so. The fact that this is an irreducible operation uh, uh, representation means that if we apply creation operators uh, like this, so for n bigger than zero, to the element one, which generates the cohomology of the zero field, which is after the point, we get all the cohomologies of all the units. And uh, if one, one can work out from this what the dimension of the cohomology group should be, and uh, it is uh, the cohomology dimension that I gave before. Unless, of course, I mean, I haven't really said all the relations, but anyway, so that's one. Um, then one can go on here, for instance, Jane uh, uh, showed some time ago that, uh, you know, when you have a Heisenberg uh, algebra, then in a step, there's a canonical way how to get the DSO algebra out of that in terms of the Heisenberg operators. And Lane showed that this DSO algebra is related to the ring structure of the homology rings of Hilbert schemes of points so that you can use it to study the ring structure and to, <coughs> to do computations with it and uh, to understand the structure. And Carl uh, uh, Kukov uh, had written a paper where they somehow upgrade this to also have some vertex operators. I'm not going to say what that is, uh, because uh, most of what I don't know precisely, but anyway, there's uh, you no know, things related, for instance, to the tangent bundle can be expressed in terms of, uh, of the Hilbert scheme can be expressed in terms of vertex operators, which are maybe you know, one step up in complication from. Okay, so this was this. Now I want to briefly talk about um, what is actually the so that thing is not so useful for the, is that time right there up to uh, modulo uh, three hours or is it 
plus 420. Okay. Okay. okay, so now we want to talk about one last basis of sheaves. <coughs> Um, so, if, so just I review S is a surface, a surface H and S. We want a space which parameterizes uh, within sheets on S with fixed numerical invariants numeric numeric like with fixed shell classes. But uh, this uh, such a space will not exist, at least not as an algebraic variety. But we have to put the condition we want the sheets to be semi state. And that basically means that the sub sheets. So you think of the bundles, the sub bundles shouldn't be too big. They shouldn't have too many sections. And so uh, practically this means such a sheet is same thing with respect to the M class H, that if we take the sections H0 of F tend to H to the N divided by the rank of F for any subsheet, this is smaller equal to the same thing for E, as long as N is large enough. So the you know, as, we, if, as we twist with powers of the ample class, uh, <clears throat> the sections of subsheets don't grow faster uh, uh, than those of the sheet itself. And then by GIT, there exists a model like space of semi stable Korean sheets with uh, given rank and given chain classes. And our pivot uh, <clears throat> team of points can be viewed as a model like space of rank one sheets. Uh, with first term class equal to zero and or term equal to zero and uh, the second term class equal to n because basically the, the singularities of the sheet will correspond to the second term class by just sending uh, c to its ideal sheet. Um, one can show that uh, every sheet of rank one with these term classes must be the ideal sheet of a zero dimensional subscheme. And so this is uh, this parameterizes all this. This is the model. So now uh, I want to just say a few uh, things. Uh, so, for instance, such a modelized space, uh, and this, so rank R one to two will depend on the amplitude class H. There is a system of walls and chambers. So, for instance. Rank, the rank is equal to two uh, in the second homology with R coefficients, there are some words uh, which are hyperplanes, uh, the orthogonal hyperplanes to certain classes in the uh, second homology with Z coefficient, so orthogonal with respect to the intersection form. And then the modelized space will be constant in the chambers as it changes when one crosses the wall. And uh, what happens if one crosses such a wall is that um, uh, if you go from each class, such as psi times each class bigger than zero, which minus such as psi times each minus is smaller than zero, what you do is you take sheets which lie in extensions like this, by C tensor A equals to E equals to IW tensor B equals to zero or some zero dimensional subscheme such that the first term classes of E minus A is C is replaced by extensions the other way around. So this will be, uh, and so uh, this is basically is very related to what was mentioned in, in, the, in the talk uh, last week. So this is a, a flip or flop of the modelized space, of the modelized space, or a certain bi-rational transformation of the modelized space. And <clears throat> so obviously there, if there's more complicated things happens in higher rank and there's vast generalizations in the meantime, so more crossing for bridge and stability things, but it always can be somehow related to, to some extent to university so policy. Okay, so uh, more generally, uh, I have mentioned this in the previous uh, lectures in the last year. Um, there's Mochizuki's formula, which allows us to compute intersection numbers on all that basis of rank R sheaves on S in terms of intersection numbers on products, on products of R Hilbert schemes of points. There's a way how we can take any formula, I mean, any expression in formology classes on, on this modular space. Actually, with its virtual fundamental class, whatever, but we don't talk about that. Um, and the evaluation of that on this fundamental class 
to be equal to sum over certain n1 to nr of uh, certain other cohomology classes, which you can explicitly determine in terms of that. I've written down you know, some months ago the actual formula, which is pretty terrible, uh, which you instead have to do on products of Hilbert. So this means basically any computation on the smaller space of sheets can be done on Hilbert's group of forms. So that's uh, uh, also nice. <laughs> okay. So this was as much as I wanted to say about this. It's just an overview about things. So then <clears throat> I want to briefly talk about hypertaylor reports. So that is Hilbert's rules the hypertaylor. So <clears throat> So if X is a smooth projective variety of dimension N, it's called hyperscalar or irreducibly irreducible uh, polymorphic symplectic. If there exists a, <coughs> a unique everywhere non-degenerate polymorphic two form. So it's a polymorphic two form, so that if I take the the end uh, batch power of it, this becomes a trivial one, it vanishes nowhere. Okay. So, for instance, if the dimension of X is 2, then this means X is a KP surface. For instance, if I draw a, a quartic in P3. And, and so, for a long time, uh, I mean, there was even once a theorem that, uh, that these are all irreducible, that these are all uh, hyperkähler manifolds. There was a theorem given by Hugo Mono. That proves that. Uh, and then, however, it is not true. Uh, and uh, we will show that uh, uh, if uh, X is the KT surface, then the Hilbert of endpoints is hyperkähler. Uh, but anyway, so these hyperkähler uh, varieties have a very rich structure. So, one thing when that they have is this real Bogomolo quadratic uh, form on the second cohomology. So, this is uh, this is a quadratic form on the second cohomology, which behaves in many ways like the intersection form on the second cohomology of the surface. So that somehow this hypercalar varieties have a little bit of a surface flavor. Uh, and it contains, uh, it somehow involves many geometric properties of our hypercalar variety. So as I said, if S is a K3 surface, then SN is hypercalar. More generally, in Kai show that F is a K3 surface and we take any modelized space of sheets. Where stable is equal to single stable, so which doesn't have to be, which is not singular, <coughs> uh, then this modelized space must be hypercalar. Um, and then Holbeck or Yoshioka, or, I mean, there are many papers, but Holbeck, Yoshioka, and others, which shows that if we have such a modelized space which is non singular of dimension when, then it must be uh, deformation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of n points. So the, these are all uh, these uh, modelized spaces on KT surfaces. Actually, up to deformation or up to diffeomorphism are just Hilbert schemes of points. Uh, there are uh, a few more examples of hypercalar uh, varieties, even up to deformation. I mean, there are also other constructions which are different, but uh, there are other families. But all of them can be related to modelized spaces of sheaves on KT surfaces or abelian surfaces. And it, or in particular, can be related to Hilbert schemes of points on KT, no, no, smaller piece of sheets. And in an important case, it's uh, one of Hilbert schemes of points. <coughs> um, there might be more examples, it's, it, there's no complete classification, but for the long Anyway, this fact that uh, if uh, this is, uh, if you have a non singular modelized space and it's information equivalent to the Hilbert scheme, can be used in many cases if you want to prove something about. Uh, uh, modelized space of sheets on KT services is often essentially enough to do for Hilbert schemes of points. Then you finish the proof by deformation. Okay, so that's a uh, very uh, useful proposition. Okay, then I come to one other kind of ancient uh, application of this. Uh, I mean, this is an old story. So if S is a KT surface, uh, L is a line bundle on S, where the seventh sector of the first joint class is 2G minus 2, then you expect that the number of rational curves in the complete linear system L, so which the number of rational curves, which are zeros of sections of L, uh, that number should be finite. You call this number NG. It actually turns out to only depend on G if you count the curves as multiplicity. And uh, Yao Zato conjectured 
a long time ago that um, that if you take a general input function of this number, this is the product that can be given zero minus one minus x to the n to minus twenty four. And now <coughs> the Euler number of the Hilbert scheme is twenty four. So this is the generating function for the Euler number of the Hilbert constant. So this is uh, uh, quite remarkable. And the point is, we proves this conjecture uh, relating uh, the question of counting the curves to Hilbert in the point somehow shows that. Uh, you can count the curves in terms of the Euler numbers of the so-called compacted by Jacobians, and these compacted by Jacobians, the, the space of compacted by Jacobian, the relative compacted by Jacobian can be is deformation equivalent because we are on a hypercalar manifold. Uh, uh, so a Hilbert scheme of points on the surface, and so uh, you get this, and then. Uh, some time ago, I discussed this also with John many years ago. I generalized this conjecture to a conjecture about algebraic surfaces. And this conjecture has, in the meantime, been proven many times. And at least most of the proofs are in terms of Hilbert schemes of points. Okay, so this was that. Um, now, how much time? Ah, so actually, faster than I can. I kind of. That left the difficult part to the end and end and hope to be saved by the goal, but <laughs> it's not going to happen, maybe. Anyway, so now I want to, in the last bit, I want to, I want to maybe get a little bit more technical and give you two useful tools for working with these Hilbert schemes. So the first one is what uh, we have called uh, cobordism invariance um, or something like that. So. We have this story. We have this universal subscheme uh, ZNS in S times SN, and uh, <coughs> we we know there is this rational map from S times SN to SN plus one, which is defined outside the universal subscheme. And so one can indeed resolve the indeterminacy of this map by blowing up the universal subscheme. In fact, if you blow up the universal subscheme, you get an, an incidence correspondence. You get uh, you if you blow up Inside the product of the universal subscheme, you get the instant correspondence of subschemes of length n and n plus one. And so this will allow us to compute intersection numbers of Sn on Sn recursively. So you can somehow one can understand what happens if you kind of <coughs> go, you know, apply this blow up from Sn n plus to so if you have a class of the Hilbert scheme of n plus one points. You pull it back to this thing and you push it forward to this. And you can understand what you're doing when you do this to a certain extent. And so and so you and you, you can build up a recursion of computers. And so uh, we did this. And what you find, for instance, when you work with these topological sheets that you had before, we have the following statement. I don't know why I put this all in one. So we assume again we have this topological sheet as we had before. So she go back to 100. Then we have the following statement. So first, just introduce this notation. If I have polynomial in variables di and ej, and then I say I take I call p of s and dn, where I replace uh, uh, the di by the churn classes of of this topological sheet and the uh, Ej by the churn class of the tangent bundle of Sn to the churn class of Sn. So this whole thing, if I apply this to the polynomial, this will be a homology class of the Hilbert scheme or on the Hilbert scheme of any points on S. Now <clears throat> we want we want to have somehow something that behaves nicely with generating functions. When we do this, so we know the following. If it well, assume we have two disjoint surfaces, S1, S2. So if you have n points on uh, two disjoint surfaces, what is that? It's n one point on one surface, n two on the other, such that n one plus n two is equal to n, and over all possibilities. And the same is true also for subsystems. So therefore, we get the Hilbert scheme of uh, if uh, uh, of n points on this disjoint union is this. Now, now, let's, now assume we have. Kind of polynomials like this for every n bigger than zero. 
And we assume that whenever n is the sum of n1 plus n2, if we take this polynomial here, and uh, so this is a class of the Hilbert scheme of, and uh, so S is still supposed, S is now supposed to be the distribution of the corner between 1 and S2. So we take this uh, polynomial here and restrict it to this part of it, this component. Then it's just the product of the corresponding things uh, on the two factors. Assume we have that, then it follows from the recursion that the generating function of these polynomials evaluated on the fundamental class of the Hilbert schemes is given as a product of five universal power series. So we have five universal power series, A0 to A4, in one variable, depending, these power series depend only on the rank of V. And the other numeric information that we have here, which is the second trans class of V, the first trans class of V squared, C1 of D times KS, KS squared, and this are just taken as powers of V. So this uh, this follows from the recursion by some, I mean, you do the recursion, you do some argument, and then so that's uh, in a nutshell what one gets. Okay, so this is a, what? Stop, just don't go away. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so this is the this statement. Okay, and so you so basically the, as a first step, if you have such a polynomial, you evaluate it on the Hilbert scheme, it's just the polynomial in the churn numbers of the surface and the bundle, and then uh, on, on, on the surface, and then uh, you know this condition that we put here uh, ensures that it behaves nicely with this generating number. But, but there's no statement about how it depends on R. But it's not the idea. So no. which are there new power series? Yeah, yeah. So what one can do is that so there we well, a little bit more because actually so the first step is that if you have a uh, if you have such a polynomial so if you evaluate on the Hilbert scheme you get a polynomial in the corresponding uh, churn numbers on the surface and the rank. So it's also polynomial in the red. So in that sense, it somehow it depends in a certain way polynomially on the red. So the, the coefficients here, if I take the coefficient of this of x to the something, this is the polynomial of degree at most something in R. Okay, so in that sense, uh, uh, the, the, the is, it, does, it doesn't depend arbitrarily, it depends polynomially. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, so that was that. And now um, I wanted to end up talking about the other thing which I will use in the second part of the, the talk, which is localization. So <clears throat> action then localization. So if X is a smooth projective variety with an action, say, for concreteness of T, which C star times C star, so of some chorus C to the end, C star to the end, but I, I choose this because I will use the data. Uh, and we assume the action has finite many fixed points. Then we want to use this to compute intersection numbers corresponding to equivalent vector bundles on X. So assume E is an equivalent vector bundle of rate R on X. So that means that the action of uh, uh, of the torus leads to X compatible. No? So then. Uh, because of this, in particular, so if it's an equivalent bundle like that, if I have a fixed point, the fiber or the fixed point is a vector space with an action of the torus. So it's a representation of, of this torus. So, and it's known that if you have an action of such a torus on a vector space, the, uh, the vector space must have a basis of eigenvectors, of common eigenvectors for the whole torus. That's something on the group. So at each fixed point, the fiber has a basis of eigenvectors for the T action. So we can write the I as the sum like this, uh, K equals one for R, C, the I. And the eigenvalues are powers, if we apply T1 to 2 in the torus to it, they are powers, uh, they are you know, monomials in T1 to 2. Um, the one monomial. So we get this. And then we, can define what, what I could call the 
what something from E of PI is the sum of C V I K or is no K. Well C is the is it, uh it's oh yeah, so it, it, this is an I, no I equal to so A is equal to I. No, no, I is all that I don't know, no, no. So yeah, I PIK, yeah, PIK, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's a misprint. So somehow in here in particular now they I somehow I somehow have kind of and this is also the IK Anyway. Okay, so then I can look at something with, which I could call the equivalent total charge class of the fiber of the vector bundle at the point. This is the sum of the corresponding charge class, equivalent charge classes. This is just the product I equals one to R. So the I should be maybe the K, K equals one to R, uh, one. Uh, plus nk epsilon i plus nk uh, epsilon 2, where n1 and the, 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 I mean these mesh, so these, these power. There's a polynomial in epsilon 1, epsilon 2. So the, the equivalent homology of the point is the polynomial ring, and in this case, the variable with epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and this is this equivalent homology term. And so the, the i church class of this, uh, this, I mean the part of the degree. I in epsilon one, epsilon two of this expression. So I have all the the, the churn classes. So I can, so to speak, for every point, say what the churn class is as a polynomial in this. Term. And now, uh, assume we have any polynomial in the churn classes of E. Okay. Then the quadratic formula tells me the following, or the current optimization formula tells me the following. If I want to Evaluate this on X. So I take this polynomial in turn classes, I integrate over the fundamental class of X. This will be a number. I can do this as follows. I take the same polynomial in these equivalent turn classes at all the points. I divide it by the corresponding thing for the top churn class of the tension bundle, or for the Euler class of the tension bundle at every point. And I sum this expression over all the fixed points, one, two. Now, if you think of it, this is an incredible mess. So at each point, at, you know, at each fixed point, you have a rational function in epsilon one, epsilon two, you know, a polynomial epsilon one, epsilon two divided by another polynomial, and you sum it over all the fixed points. And then I claim one should take the put epsilon one, epsilon two. Equal to zero in this, this if or seems to be nonsense because there's no reason why I should be able to do this. But the theorem guarantees that this expression actually is a polynomial in epsilon one, epsilon two. The denominator has to cancel by the theorem, and then we can put epsilon one x and epsilon two equal to zero, and we get our answer. So this is the bottom resting formula. And you know, <coughs> and uh, you know, this is. Even useful, for instance, when the answer is zero, because you have certain expressions have to be zero. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know whether I have to. <laughs> this is the property form, I don't know whether it's here to you. Now, one can try to apply this in the case of the Hilbert scheme of points. Uh, am I allowed to change the page? or? <laughs> so, so let's, for simplicity, assume that our surface is P2. Then uh, the torus C star times C star will act on it on P2 uh, in the usual way by getting the coordinates like this, and then the fixed points uh, will be, let's say, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, like this. If you have these fixed points, that should have a double point between them, moving the coordinates, and uh, we have can apply uh, so. The local equivalent coordinates near points to point P0 would be x minus 1 divided by 0 by this. And the action of these coordinates, therefore, will be like this. And we can compute what the action of the local coordinates near P1 to do this, obviously. This is an exercise. Now, a sub scheme uh, in the Hilbert scheme of n points is T invariant. If, if that's T invariant under this action, obviously, its support must be T invariant. So it must consist. Of a subset of these three uh, fixed points. And so C will be union of three subschemes which supported at one of the fixed points. 
And so this allows us to reduce to the case that the support of our sub scheme is just one fixed point. So we have the product over this. For instance, we let's assume it's P0. Then it's easy to see the sub scheme will be T invariant if and only if it's ideal in, say, case C, say, CXY is generated by monomials. Now you can see that, uh, you know, otherwise when you apply the action, the ideal will move. So because of this, you can write your idea like this. You can write generate so that here like this is x to the n0, y, x to n1, and so on, y to the r, x to the nr, where the, so what so to speak, not in the idea uh, is uh, what the, the O of the subscheme is, and the, the, the dimension of the O of the subscheme will be the sum of DNI. So the N0 until NR is a partition of N, because obviously, if these are the generators of the idea, these numbers NI must go down. So therefore, we see that the fixed point of the action uh, on P2 to the N are in bijection with triples of partitions. Uh, and each of these partitions is a partition of some numbers so that these three numbers add up to n. Okay, now my time is up. Now comes the slightly more general thing. So now, because for instance, we want to do this for these topological bundles and for the tangent bundle, we have to know what the action is. So I just briefly, very briefly, will sketch out this. Well, if we take OF, this vector bundle, so corresponding to the trivial bundle, it's a vector bundle for n, it's fiber. It's just the structure sheet of the subscheme. And if we have a union, if Z is the union of these with the positive Pi, the, the O of this is just the direct sum. So the, the total equivalent term class is just the product of them. So well, let's just look at an example. Assume that Z is the ideal generated by these. Then the fiber of Z is uh, this quotient. So it has an equivalent basis, 1x, x squared, and y. And we know how. Uh, how T1 and T2 act on X. So it acts on X by multiplying by T1 and on Y by multiplying by T2. And so we get the eigenvalues of the action are these. And so that means that the eigenvector, the eigenvalues, not eigenvectors, eigenvalues are these T1 to the C of S, T2 to the R of S, where C of S is the row in this thing, starting with zero. Uh, in this diagram, and R of S is, uh, let me see. Uh, so this is the, so C of S is the column, 0, 1, 2, um, and uh, uh, R of S is the row, 0, 1. And so this gives me this. And so in this particular case, what we get for the total equivalent term term is this. So we replace the T to the i by i times epsilon i. And for the tangent bundle, it's more complicated. I cannot explain how you get this, but what you find is the following. For the tangent bundle, you get uh, the following eigenvectors for this, the eigenvalues. This is T1 to the minus the arm length of S plus 1, T to the back length, and here the other round, where the arm length is, if you are in this diagram, uh, this is how many are further to this side of my thing, which is the arm length of one, of this one here is two, of the x is one and so on, and the leg length is how many are below. And so we get this formula, and so if one works this out, uh, you get that the total equivalent term class of this thing is this. And so obviously one can kind of now compute with this, we just uh, sum up over all the fixed points, we do this uh, uh, combinatorial, we have this combinatorial data of all the partitions, we sum it up and, but, and we get some expression and that's our answer to any question you might want to ask. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> about intersection. So maybe, so this is the end of this half. Uh, I went maybe two minutes over, but uh, uh, okay, are there questions? Um, I mean, <clears throat> no comments? The same as before, this A0 to A4, yeah. a completely universe prefix R. Yeah. So can you give us the first uh, the first two coefficients known as polynomials in R, 
Are they completely known if R is small or what is known? That will depend on the, you know, so you see, or they are, they are completely universal. So they are universal. So I forgot something. But they're not universal. They depend on more. The universal means. Yes. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no. But, but I, I, I forgot something because here I have to prolong your P. Obviously, they depend also on P and R. But it's all this, you know, all this stuff. No, yeah. no, no, but I, I made a mistake. Yeah, yeah very fast. Yeah. The universal means it only depends on. It only depends. It only depends. So here we have this P. So P was any polynomial. We have a set of polynomials. Obviously, it cannot be that it only depends on R. So that was my mistake. So it depends on P and R. So on to the polynomials, you only need the value for n equals 1. This is this addition point. Well, anyway, so it only. So it should depend on very little. Yeah, yeah it depends on very little, but it's. Uh, we will see uh, in, the, in the second half, we see one example of this, or two, two or two, actually three examples, and then one can see what these power series are. But in there, you know, it's not, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, we have to work a little bit on the formulation of that. So, <laughs> okay. So, if there are no further questions, maybe, you know, so the break is all for the purpose that whoever wants to run away can run away. So you have your chance to run away with both my eyes. And then, uh, and who doesn't? So you, if you don't take your chance, I will start now with the second half. Or if somebody wants to go, I mean, whatever. There's some. <laughs> I think the break should be what? The break should be a break. I think. So at least two minutes. Okay. So let's have yeah, two minutes minute break. Then. Okay. Sure. But I, I don't want a long break because then it goes forever and ever. But, uh, so, yeah, okay, that's maybe, I don't know how useful that is. And then you can already announce the. You can check it with the moment. That's maybe I can see it. Uh, so I'm not sure, but you know, this was the form of the heat or something this morning. And I, you know, I, anyway. Yeah, now comes the. Now, if he wants to talk about the form of the heat, I somehow. Well, indeed, he's right. I think it's true. If one only needs to know what P1 is, then it's determined in terms of P1. Yeah, one plus P1. And... No, 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 no. I mean, what his question. So, uh, uh, I think it will most likely be true, but I should work it out. That, uh, but, uh, this was not how it was formulated in our paper. Uh, uh, if you know P1, the first point of R, oh, right, and, and R, then uh, this will be determined. Obviously, not P0, so there's nothing there. Is there a higher rank uh, version of the box space, like for frame sheets on P2? Uh, because bot is similar, but the uh, frame sheets is not similar. Is there a um, that it makes sense to find something? Well, I mean, uh, I mean yeah. yeah. There are certainly, you, you, I mean, I'm not quite sure what you have decided it's some kind of thing, but you know, there are uh, certain uh, papers where such uh, representations are considered to higher range. I mean, it's often, um, uh, if they're you know, completed, I mean, they're completed, they are better than quite a few papers for that. So, uh, are there any other conjectures that should come near any kind of construction? They have what I call that. The first one is the model of model. Oh, and there's, you know, if you think, I mean, in principle, the, this whole work of, uh, of joy is maybe some sense to make some sense of that. But in there, he worked a bit different because he worked with the, with the set and so on, and so he not really the sheet. But then there is also, he has a work that we have for us. So, and the thing was given to me. No, no, that's true. That's the yeah, yeah, that's the end. Ah, no, I
Okay, so let's go. Okay, so let's let's start again. So by the way, the answer to your question is this thing depends only on the first polynomial, as you said, and R. Oh, as you said. So that's uh, something. Okay. So <clears throat> now uh I told this is the second part of this uh, new the joint work with Antonelli. So we talk about the Linda and Sega formula for everything from points. That's something I also have discussed many times over the years with Don, but uh, uh, now the, uh, the solution is with Antonelli, who also was a professor here uh, some time ago. So let me see what I should. Yeah, you are still there. <laughs> okay, so now so we do that. So let me just start again. Now. So we have the Hilbert series points. We know what this is. So it's a vector of dimension n. So maybe you don't need to copy the same thing. And so we have a, it's again related to the symmetric power like that of knowable. And it's a unique dimension of the Hilbert of symmetric power. And then we have this universal subscheme, which is in the product of the, the surface and the points and with these two projections here q so this is all full stuff so here i can put it again so then we have we call out the topological speech so if you be the vector bundle of length rms we pull back from the surface from the universal subscreen we push down and we get this universal this topological sheet this fiber is just a zero of the this construction also extends to the group of the group of vector bundles. So the difference of vector bundles like this, uh, we goes to this. And so therefore we also have in some sense this corresponding construction for sheets on the surface. Okay. Um, and we know that the line bundles, we can all the line bundles on the Hilbert scheme by taking the determinants of these. So this we have before. Now we want to understand two things. We want to know uh, how many sections do these line bundles have, or now in this case, what is the holomorphic order characteristic? So the alternating sum of the commodity dimension of the commodity groups of these determinant bundles. And another thing is that we might be interested in we can take uh, one of these topological bundles, we take its top term class. Get the return class corresponding to the dimension of the Hilbert scheme, we integrate over it, we get a number. I want to know what these numbers are. And we can do this also when the length of the bundle is negative. So the, if the, the, the top term class of minus Cn is the top Sega class of the n. So therefore, classically, one was interested more in the Sega uh, formula. Uh, and so uh, I call this thing the Sega formula, although I always talk of it in terms of the top term class. But there's no difference because we can always, you know, as we come work with tapering classes, uh, we can uh, always uh, assume the rank is negative if we want to. So, okay, so this is these formulas we want to compute. Okay, so first, uh, why should anybody care? Well, Okay, there might be many reasons uh, or whatever, like the mountain because it's there, but they, you know, somehow, <clears throat> uh, one thing that one could say is why, are the, for the Vanilla formula, why are the corresponding subsets the C to the ideal sheet? We have, as you already said, that the Hilbert scheme of n points is a modular space of rank one sheets on the surface. Uh, and therefore, if we take the Vanilla formula for uh, the Hilbert scheme, this is the rank one case of the, what one would call a general Valinda formula for surfaces. So the Valinda formula for surfaces would be such a formula for all modular spaces of sheets on the surface. And uh, uh, as one knows, there was the corresponding analog for curves for modular spaces of vector bundles on uh, 
of course, is the celebrated Belinda formula, which uh, you know is, uh, was first projected in physics, and many people proved they also don't wrote something about it and so on. So this is uh, an important thing. So we want to generalize it from this from curves to surfaces, and this would somehow be the first step. Okay. Uh, then, what is why we don't care about the Sagan formula? I mean, there might be again the main reason is maybe because it's there, but the, it has, for instance, an innovative meaning. It counts, uh, you no, know, it counts contributions of points in special positions. You know? So if you take a chunk class of something, it means it's uh, that so and so and so many sections uh, impose less conditions and so on. So uh, in this case, for instance, if we take a surface in P to n plus minus two, and we take the hyperplane bundle on this, and we take its restrictions to S, then the integral over Sn of the top C class of this uh, corresponding uh, uh, logical bundle, which will be the number, I mean, if H is F enough, will be the number of n minus two planes, so, so n minus two dimensional uh, subprojective uh, sub spaces of the n minus two, which are n seeking to S. So this means the number of configurations of n points which lie, uh, which span only something of dimension n minus two and not n minus one as we normally should. Okay, so this would be an example, but there you could write other formulas for other things and you would get this. Okay, so this would be you know, one, uh, one thing, thing how I can interpret this. So, <clears throat> So we therefore we want to a formula for this generating function. I mean it's a natural thing that you know this depends on the NP scheme depends on N. We know there's syntactic structure, so it's natural to make to write down the generating function. So we have the generating function for the Melinda formula, and we have the generating function for the Sega formula. And we would like to know what they are. So the first step. Is that we can use this coordinate invariant, which I just told you about. We here we are in a situation where this theorem that I had just a few minutes ago applies. So we have that this generating function for the Linde formula is a product of four universal power series, which I choose. I mean, I could say it's C1 of V squared, uh, whatever, but I, I, you know, I, I could choose them differently, but it's just, it depends that all the numbers are there. So I, I take here the whole morphic I call it the determinant of V, okay, one half chi of S, uh, this expression, this, and here for the, the term invariant, there's one more invariant which plays the role, which is the second term class of V. Because if you look at the determinant bundle of V, this will be independent of the second term class of V. So, so therefore, uh, no, it's just you not know, it only sees the first term class, so therefore we have here only the, the this one. So we have these two. We know if I all right that there are four universal power series for this and five universal power series for this. Uh, and these universal power series now depend on, on K, which is the rank of okay. So we have these are now totally universal because we have fixed what the problem is. And so they depend on, on this if we have this expression. So to know what this thing is, is the same as knowing these nine powers. So if you want to solve the limit problem, we have to know these four. So this is uh, the same. Okay, so I'm allowed to move on, or how is it? <laughs> I will just move on. So I, I, I repeat this here for the Belinda series. In the Belinda series, uh, so we had this, uh, we knew for Calcut Walls this invariant that was looked like this. So then in this paper where we proved the coordinate invariants, we also showed that with this change of value, so if, if the, this x, which counts on which Hilbert scheme we are, the coefficient of x to the n is what happens on the n Hilbert scheme, if we make a change of value and call this minus t times one minus t to the r minus one, where r is the length of b, then we can at least determine two of these power series, namely A1 is just one minus T, and A2 is one minus T to the R squared divided by one minus R squared T. So very simple power series. And at least when R is very small, zero, one, two, uh, zero, one, or minus one, 
these equivalent power harmlessly adjust the cost of power to one. It happens in general that these policies start with one. Okay, so this is from the Bellini. Now, for the Sega uh, series, there is this old conjecture by Ling, which uh, I think I think you also had a bit ahead of him in that door, no? I think he, he wrote in his paper, he consulted you to find this, uh, this conjecture formula. And this is an explicit formula for this uh, Sega series. So this the, the Sega uh, invariant for a line bundle F. So this means the churn uh, series for minus. He gave an explicit formula for this in, in this kind of form. I mean, um, and this uh, took 30 years to prove. <coughs> was proven by Mario Oprea and Sandra Bande, uh, based on an idea of Kervaza, um, which, uh, uh, you know, it is, so it's a rather tricky geometric proof, somehow working on the uh, law of a key three surface. So, this, and so more generally, my prior fund and data papers consider this generating function for the same invariance for general vector bundles or elements in the, in the key group. And what they uh, get is, you know, we had before that we can write generating function like this uh, in terms of uh, these five universal power series, which I think to be powers. Uh, if I choose the exponents of that kind of regard, it's like simple. <coughs> so R before Mr. Brand and now R is one less than Yeah, no, so uh, yes. That, that confuses. So here, uh, yeah. But this is not a misprint, this is what it is. I mean, I. Uh, well, could you do a call for the rank in both this? Well, we see in a moment that these two ranks that we have here, they are the, the rank in the within the case, the rank in the Sega case. When one wants to look at them together, they are they differ by one. So there is some kind of anyway. So uh, but so now the case the rank of these three, and we write still R for K minus one. Over. So then we make another change of element, x is equal to minus y times one minus r y to the minus r minus one. And then we get this P0. This first one is this simple rational function. P1 uh, is uh, this simple rational function, and P2, which comes with the tie of OX, uh, so depends on the topology of, of X, is uh, of S, this rational So, uh, actually, the, the, what I mean, P writes slightly different, they have a different change of values, and then the, the, the formulas of the look different, but this is what we get, but in, in our computation, it's slightly simpler than what they have. So just this is slightly uh, more convenient. So furthermore, they, they determine these two missing power series as algebraic functions in uh, in X or in Y uh, <coughs> for small values of K. So the K, the absolute value of K is at most two. So I should make a few comments on this. So first, I mean, these formulas, both the form for the Verlinde and for the Sega formula, they look rather simple. We have no, the simple formula for the one we do, but this is after the change of variables. If you undo the change of variables, it gets quite a mess. And if we are also supposed to multiply this out if we want to know what happens on an actual Hilbert scheme. And then we get an incredibly complicated form. So um, <clears throat> so this is, so the form, so even when we are on the surface where Ks is equal to zero, this is actually a very complicated formula, even though it looks uh, separately simple. Uh, and second, uh, it is always the case that these B0, B1, B2, and uh, A1, A2, so the ones which do not contain the canonical class in the exponent, these are always much simpler to study. And the reason is that one can, can study them by just doing computations on Hilbert schemes of K3 surfaces. And as we said, the Hilbert scheme of a K3 surface is a hyperkähler variety, and one can, for instance, use the Bouville Bogomolov quadratic form or other things on K3 surfaces to compute them. And so if these three are always much easier to study than the others. These A3, E4, E3, E4, 
that we work here are much, much more difficult. And you know, normally, also in other similar problems, you cannot say anything about them. And here, uh, they could only say something in this very small. There's one further ingredient for, for this mystery, which is the relation between the Belinda and the Sagas. And this relates to the question of Don uh, or its correction. So, so there is somehow these policies E3, so the one for the uh, Sega series and A3 for the Belinda series, they are somehow the same after the change of variable. But uh, this, if we look at the Sega series for rank A, so for B of rank A, and for the Melinda series, for B of rank K minus 1. So for B, which I called R. So these two unknown power series, this is just a conjecture, uh, are related by this change of variables and in addition by changing the rank in by 1. So we take so this is uh, so this is a kind of so this is a conjecture by originally by Johnson or Johnson used some version of strain quality to uh, together with some slightly illegal arguments to uh, to to show that uh, such a statement must hold where this change of variables is given by certain intersection numbers which he couldn't quite determine only a few of them and then uh, my Oprea Pande Pande made this formula explicit. I don't know, this is also does contribute this part, but, and this is somehow the most important thing. And so conjecture that such a thing might be true. And so he, he conjectured it by giving a, an incomplete proof. So I mean, it, it was really supposed to be a conjecture, but you know, we need some help argument by the leader. And so now, how can this possibly be true? And why do we have this crazy shape between uh, Sega and Berlin? Then? By sending k to k minus one, that seems kind of ridiculous. Okay, so now this is uh, the question, and now I do what talk about what me and uh, uh, Anton do. So the first statement is so this is the result. So our uh, our results. Uh, so the first theorem is is that in the same correspondence is true. So. What I said here, this this conjecture is correct without any restriction. This is the first statement. So therefore, in order to determine the the k and the b series, it's enough to just determine a three and a four. And now, the second theorem is that with this change of variables, the same change of variables we had before for the uh, for the within the series, the a three is given by this explicit expression. So we have here one over one minus y to the r halves. So where r is uh, is the, the rate in the in the in the, in the case. And uh, the exponential of the minus sum uh, y to n to n. So we take this uh, this polynomial here, x to the r minus x to the minus one with x minus x to the minus one to the power to n. We take the coefficient of x to the zero of that. This would be some complicated uh, combination of binomial coefficients. Uh, we take the exponential of this expression. This is our answer. Okay. So now you might say this is a very complicated formula, but uh, it somehow isn't. It's much, much simpler than what anybody would have expected. And it's much, much simpler. So I did spoke to some computations before with, with Don or whatever for small cases. The individual formulas you get for small values of R are much more complicated than the general formula, which does it for all R. So it's a kind of surprisingly simple, even though it doesn't look like it. But it can also be simplified. What? But it can also be simplified, and you can work this out. You can work this thing out. I mean, how? Oh. Well, it says that the logarithmic derivative of a three of x is the sum without the one over n. Yeah, yeah, okay. and that you can compute in, in, in close form immediately. But because you want to see the the form of logarithmic derivative. Well, okay, we can discuss this afterwards. I mean, if I was making that. No, no, but still, I mean, I, when I'm here, I cannot. Uh, no, no, we can't do what you said. I'm just saying it's, yeah. it should be very easy. Oh, okay, so then, okay, so then we have already uh, made improvement for the, uh, for the main theorem, but anyway, so we uh, we'll see. And so there's an alternative way of saying the same thing, which I'm not sure is uh, related to. Uh, so we can also say it differently. Uh, 
we we take this expression here. So x to the one half minus x to the minus one half squared divided by this. So this is the power start series starting with x to the r minus one. We take the reverse power series, so the the, co the compositional inverse. Now, as it starts with x to the r minus one, there are r minus one branches of it, which somehow differ to some extent by doing something with r two of unity. So we have there are therefore r minus one branches of the inverse power series to this, which I call alpha i of y. And then this thing here, after this change of error, is uh, can be written like this. I don't know whether this is any better, but anyway, y to the one half, if I know this is the same as here, and here the product of these. So this is another expression for the same. I have introduced this so that we can talk about A4 for so the, the, final, the final missing power series. And so here, so we have again this formula that I just wrote down, where these were these branches of the inverse of this, uh, this rational function. <clears throat> and then now the claim. I don't know whether you can simplify that. Uh, so if I again take the same change of variables, then you know these are both these starting with one. So writing it like this is the same as saying what they call it can be written in this form in terms of these factors of the AI. So we have this complicated expression. So some simple rational function like this, and then product ij from one to r minus one of the alpha i alpha j one minus alpha i three there. And here for the R power, when we assume that I we have this whole no whatever. So this is a an oversized <laughs> Yeah. So um, okay, so I hope I was wrong. So this is a, but this is just a conjecture. So we uh, are able to uh, we know that this is true, but our proof does not uh, extend to that. What? So the first point is all I and J. Yeah, and the second problem is only the other different. Yes. Yeah, you could also, I mean, uh, okay, and that's just the way it's. <laughs> I mean, uh, actually, if I'm, I have some, done some computation for the higher rank, so what actually happens is that uh, uh, correctly the formula would be also here the product over all i and j, and then you divide by the thing with the i with the ai squared. And with the second power because it, that's how it generalizes better. But anyway, this is what. It is. Okay, so this is the conjecture, and uh, so so this gives these two things. Uh, if I believe in the conjecture, this gives a complete answer for the both for the Verlinde and the Sega formula. Um, and the proof it, this is proven when the s squared is equal to zero because that term is then there. And uh, so this conjecture. You know, we know it's true because you know some years ago with Don Zagi, uh, you know, he told me how to compute efficiently uh, uh, this algorithm with localization on the Hilbert scheme of points, um, and so I was able to uh, so we were able to compute with uh, with R this rank in a variable until the 50 Hilbert I mean the 49 Hilbert scheme of points. So if you look at the output, this is uh, so to many megabytes of, of very big numbers, and this formula explains all these numbers. Okay, so after we know that this this is correct for any vector one for any k-theory class on every Hilbert scheme until the forty-nine. Okay, so therefore we uh, we are sure that it's true. Okay, so that so now that's not yet. Oh, so this is uh, as much as we know about the question how I asked, as I asked it, but there's one more step. Namely, uh, we can compute something more than the Sega and the Verlinde formula. We can compute some finer invariant on the Hilbert scheme of points, which contains both the Sega invariant and the Verlinde uh, invariant as a limit. So we have a, a, a finer formula which contains both of them. And so what we compute is this crazy thing. So now this is the same thing as I wrote always before, but now without the chair and the bare in it. And so we take the sum, we just have one put change the sign of but anyway, this is how it comes out naturally. And so minus x to the n, the holomorphic order characteristic of so it's a lambda minus z of this uh, topological bundle. 
times the determinant of the topological uh, value corresponding to all to the minus one. Uh, and you take chi of this. And obviously, when I write something, so lambda minus c means the alternating, uh, the, the sum of the alternating uh, powers of, that, of, of the bundle uh, with coefficient minus c to the end, where when I write it like this, obviously means that the z just comes out of the, of the equation. So this thing, uh, it should not mean the No, it's, 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 it's the x and z, power c is an x and z. Okay, so this is a mystery. Um, and so, so we can look at this thing, and now one can see that this specializes both to Berlinde and Chern. So the first thing is kind of easy. At least when we take uh, the judge for simplicity, assume that V is just a vector bundle of red K, then uh, lambda to the n times, so then this thing has rank, Vn has rank n times K, so lambda to the n times K of this thing is the determinant of n times k, of, of, is the determinant of, of uh, this vn. So, uh, so therefore we see if we take the coefficient uh, of x to the n, z to the nk of this expression, and then because of the stupid sign we have here with the sign, uh, this is just the holomorphic order practice of this. But here we have the determinant of this bundle. But here we still have this factor, so we have the determinant of the n tends to the determinant of OS to the minus one, which is the same of the, as the determinant of V minus OS to the n. Okay, so this is one limit of uh, this coefficient. And what is slightly less obvious to see is that if you do this, and I didn't just write it all, uh, then if you put here this replace x by this expression and z by this expression, then you apply riemann roch and uh, some computations in homology, then you see that the limit if epsilon goes to zero is this term. So this is uh, some computation which one has to do. It's not particularly difficult, but obviously you can't see it off end at least. Uh, and uh, obviously if there's a misprint in this formula, uh, then it would be more difficult. But I think it's correct. <clears throat> and so you can see here already that you have this difference that here, uh, if we have I here in rank k, then we get the corresponding uh, churn invariant in rank k, but we get the Berlinde uh, formula in rank k, k minus one. So it somehow explains this drop in rank by one. So these two are related by one uh, power series, but uh, you know, in, in different ways. Anyway, so this is something. And then uh, again, we can apply the proportion invariant, which says, Invariance that this thing is again written as a, uh, the product of power five universal power series, one to the power of two, chi of v, and so on, uh, where these five universal power series uh, depend only on the rank of v. Okay, so we have the same equation. Now, we have made our problem a little bit more difficult. We want to compute. Uh, what these power series are. If we know what these power series are, we know what the A's and the B's are, and we know much more because we have a much finer invariant than both the Sega and the Berlin. Okay, and so the answer is this, which is uh, now, I don't know, a little bit on the crazy side. <clears throat> so, again, as usual, these power series are never nice in the original. So, if we if we're right in terms of X and, X and Z, it's uh, the total horror. So, we have to make a change of variables. Now, now we have power series of two variables, so we make a, we make changes of variables in both variables. So the x now becomes u times 1 minus u to the r, the r is k minus 1, and uh, divided by this, and the z becomes this. And we also keep in mind that we want to call y this combination of u and v. So this is a certain function of u and v, y. So then, because we will find out that many of these power series do not depend on x and y or u and v independently, but they only depend on y. So what we find is that if I take the product of g0 and g1, so this was these, uh, these first two, then this is just 1 minus y. So what it means is 1 minus this, where x is expressed like this. So it's in, in the end a rather complicated thing, but in, in this after change of something simple. 
uh, G0, for example, to G1 cannot be expressed in terms of Y. It's uh, this, and then you can flip what G1 is. <coughs> so some rational function in U and D. G2 is also a rational function in U and D, which is a bit more complicated. I mean, to say uh, my view. <coughs> and uh, then, however, G3 and G4, which are the ones which are the most difficult ones in general, again, only depend on Y. And in fact, they are the functions we already know. If we take this y, then g3 is just a3. So if you take well, this j3, this is uh, just uh, you know it's just the a3 from before when we have replaced the y by this uv divided by this, and then uh, x like this. So this is kind of amazing, and for g4 the same. So they depend only on y, and the formula is the same as they were for the uh, for the Berlin form. This is this is the same, and so one could now say that I mean, although that's the uh, crazy that the beginning of the same correspondence is explained by the fact that these powers here, G3 and G4, that we are looking at here, so we know that uh, the A3 and the B3 are both uh, or <coughs> uh, Kind of specializations of G3. And so, it, but kind of different specializations. But as G3 actually only depends on one variable, Y, it turns out that therefore it must be true that they obtain from each other by a certain change of value, which is the one which was given there, and the same here. So, this, uh, if one views this as an explanation, which is maybe a bit crazy, uh, this uh, explains the same identity component, and it's clear that. Uh, the, the shift by rank of rank is one because after all this was how our uh, defined in very quick. Okay, so this is the theory. So this is the, the result. And now, uh, if there is time, I can give a few remarks about the proof. Obviously, you know, this is the first page paper and it's a, I mean, it took some three or four years to think of the argument, so it's not really uh, uh, that we can uh, explain it so far. But anyway, let's just kind of sketch some of the ideas of the proof. And then basically at some point, uh, so we have again this covariance. So, um, so it follows that the formula, you know, because of the cobordic invent, we only need to know the formula for some surfaces and some vector ones enough to determine the formula. So we can take these surfaces to be toric surfaces and the bundles to be uh, toric vector ones. So that means we have an action of these two torus on S, defined by the big points such that the action gets to be. And we can therefore use a localization form. Okay, that's maybe also why I introduced. So again, we have this is the equivalent homology. The point can be written like this for numbering. We take, say, we have e fixed points of the t action on S. We take by t1 i, t2 i the weights, which was uh, the polynomial in epsilon 1, epsilon 2, that you get for the, from the eigenvalues of the action from the tangent space at the i point. And you have this, the weights on the fiber of D at the fixed point. Each of these is a linear polynomial, n epsilon one and n epsilon two in epsilon one, epsilon two. So we have these things, and then uh, on we know that on S n the fixed points are parameterized by e tuples of partitions numbers ending up to n. And now we write down this uh, uh, so let's say slightly complicated formula. Uh, so what do we have here? <clears throat> so it depends on all these variables. X, E1, to K, Q, and T. It's a sum over all partitions. Uh, it's a generating function of something over all partitions. We take that X to the this partition in, in bracket techniques. It's the number which is partitioned. Okay, we have a sum over all partitions. And what we have here, so we we could if we have a partition n1 to in whatever, with the partition with whatever for uh, two one. Then we write, uh, uh, as we had before, we write a graph like this. Oh, 
okay? And uh, the uh, so this this is so to speak the star scale is number zero. The star is number zero. So this here we have the the rows, we have the columns. Then the if we take an element in this thing, so one box here, the the row of this would be zero, and the column of this would be one. So it's zero. So the row is zero. So this is when the row is zero. So then we are here. So the R of this thing is one, and the column is also equal to one. So this is the row. This is the R and the C that we have here. And then we have this A, which we also had before in the formula for the tangent R. So A is the A is the arm length. So if we for instance take this element here. The arm length is how many more are here? So the arm length of this thing here, so maybe that is a different thing, is equal to two. And the left length is how many are there below? And there's one below. Okay, and so we write down this incredible expression. So product into product over all elements. So all the boxes in this diagram of the partition, uh, and we, we have this over k, where k is the rate of the bundle not so far, and then so we have this expression. Okay, so this is what we have. So some explicit expression. So um, it's something which actually comes out, comes up, for instance, also for other things like uh, that's I think why one can do something with it. It also comes up, for instance, for uh, certain character varieties from all of those it's a very similar expressions are written down there. Okay, and so now we take the logarithm of this. Obviously, that's not so difficult. Now, the thing is, we have written down this formula, which is uh, you know, something uh, complicated, but if we apply Riemann Roch and localization, so we apply the Riemann Roch formula to the two. So the formula we had before for this generator of finite invariance and the localization formula on the Hilbert scheme of points. So we have here somehow some of our e tuples of partitions. So if you want, if you might try this out, then this expression is just our generating function ESE. So if we, if we replace the uh, the zi by e, so the uh, vi so d1 of i to the k of i, where we have uh, this uh, the statement that these are the weights uh, of d at the fixed point, fixed point. So if we do this, and here, this was the weight at the i fixed point of the tangent bundle of the surface. And uh, so then if we put this together, this gives us this gives us some expression in terms of the, the tangent bundle of the Hilbert scheme and of the uh, uh, in the churn class of the tangent bundle of the Hilbert scheme and the uh, and the churn classes of this topological sheet. And what we actually get is precisely what one gets by Riemann law. So okay, so this is why one writes this crazy thing. And so obviously uh, we can take the logarithm. Uh, and that's not very really the exponential of the logarithm is this. So in some sense, we have therefore yeah, the question is completely answered. So we know what this generating function is. It's this. No, simple. We just write down this formula. That's it. But the thing is, obviously, the this uh, the power series in, in X and Z, where the coefficients are incredibly complicated uh, rational function in uh, epsilon one and epsilon two, and the, it's guaranteed that these incredibly complicated rational functions actually are just polynomials. Then we can put epsilon one, epsilon two, equal to zero. But obviously, uh, practically, one cannot do that. You know, it's something incredibly complicated. So <clears throat> there's another one ray of hope. The first thing one can do, it's not trivial, is that if you look at this expression and develop it in epsilon one, epsilon two, so we take the e to the epsilon one, epsilon two, then uh, so this logarithm has the property that it has only a pole of order one in epsilon one, epsilon two. So this thing itself, the, 
the a, the, the omega, you know, you can have an arbitrary poor order in epsilon one to two, but here the poor order is only one. So it's almost a polynomial. If I multiply this thing by epsilon one, epsilon two, it's actually the power series in epsilon one, epsilon two. Okay. And then we can do the following. I will say it first here. We look at this expression. Now here, as you can see, we have a sum over the fixed fixed points on the surface. And then we can reinterpret what is written here as some equivalent class on the surface. And so then we can we can pull in this limit epsilon one epsilon two equals zero into this, and so then we get some intersection numbers of the surface, and we have the exponential of that. So that's the, uh, the that's what we do, and so it comes out in this somewhat pretty way. So. So we had this expression from before. Now we put in what we know. We know that this H has only pole of order one in epsilon one, epsilon two, and we have replaced at a fixed point, we replace the epsilon one by T one I and T two I, so the, the weights at the tangent space. So we get, if we write out what this is, we get this expression. They are higher order terms, but they don't matter because when you put epsilon one, epsilon two equal to zero, they will vanish. And so we have we can pull out one over this, which is the Euler class of the tension bundle of the surface, which one always has to divide by when one does localization. Then we have this expression: we have that h minus one minus one, uh, and this means I take all the di. You know, we take this expression here. Uh, then we have this, this, and this. And now, if you look at this, for instance, if you go on. Um, yeah, for instance, if you look at this expression, so, <clears throat> so we have, for instance, this, then these two will cancel, and we have here just this H0, and so we get, we will get H00 times uh, the Euler number of the surface, so F will be H00, so we can kind of reshuffle this, so <clears throat> The point that I want to make is when if you take here this expression, for instance, you take this one, the one times the minus. So if we take some derivative by z here, we get down some some uh, of these vijs. So for instance, if you take the first derivative, we get kind of the first term class of the bundle B, or what was it? Up? Yeah, of the bundle B. So we must try so the equivalent first term class of it. So what we get here is the local contribution of the first churn class of the surface times the churn, first churn class of the of the bundle. And so if we work this all out, we get that this by localization on the surface, this can be written like this. So C2 of B times some power theory C2, C1 squared times some power theory C11, and so on, where I can explicitly compute what this power C is. Ah, what is that mean now? Why don't we okay? So, uh, for instance, well, let's put uh, this one where we put all, uh, so with k and z, where we put all the variables here uh, in this h to be equal to z, and we take this derivative by that, then this f, which is here, comes with the Euler number of the surface, will just be this h0, 0, the e, which comes with this intersection number of the surface, to just the h minus one one and so on. It's going to be fast. Anyway, the c one one, which e one, which comes with this intersection number, is just mu minus k times the derivative of the h minus one. So the coefficient of the so remember the definition of, of this. Uh, okay, and so on. So therefore, if we know these power series here. We know all the power series and we know our answer. Okay, so we have to determine these kind of coefficients h minus one minus one, or rather some partial derivatives of them, then h minus one zero, h zero zero, h minus one one. If we know these, we know everything. And so we have to understand what they are. And for this, we use two properties that somehow are around here. Yeah? They are called regularity and symmetry. So a power series into variables like this will be called irregular with respect to k 
if the thing that we did before to get from the uh, from this refined invariant to the churn thing, if that gives us uh, you know something which is divisible by epsilon to the D, the power series in epsilon. So so power series in X and epsilon, which are always divisible by epsilon to the D. So some some kind of regularity in this limit. And it's called symmetric if uh, when we do this crazy change of variable, so x goes to x plus minus one, and z goes to x d, if it, the function goes to itself. So we have these two properties. And now what we find is that these things here, h d one d two k, is uh, minus d one minus d two regular when d one plus d two obviously here is more than equal to zero, and Secondly, they are also almost symmetric. So if we add to them something, so here we have some expression of binomial numbers, here we have uh, 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 how we call it, polylogarithms, just in one variable, x or z, then if we add this, so this thing, then it becomes symmetric. And now the point about, so, so this is actually, the first part is relatively easy. It basically follows from the fact that we already know, you know now however, we think more carefully, that if we take that the, the churn series is a limit of our refined series. If we do this correctly, equivalently, it will follow this, uh, this regularity. And the second one is a deep uh, statement. So it's, it comes from uh, symmetric function theory. It's a certain, uh, it's uh, some uh, complicated identities of generalized McDonald's polynomials, which give us uh, some kind of uh, some uh, functional equation for this omega. And this functional equation will take the logarithm uh, translation to this state. Okay. And so with this, uh, one is basically done because there are, you know, we know these things are essentially symmetric and regular, but basically there are no symmetric and regular functions. So they are extremely restricted. And so uh, the first thing is, if we have a function which is symmetric and irregular, if d is bigger than zero, then the function must be zero, but so there are no such functions. So the only case is when uh, they are just zero regular. If they are zero regular, they actually, if all of these are supposed to depend on two variables, but then they only can depend on one variable, and it's precisely the change of variable we have before. So if we change x by this expression, and Z by this expression, then they only depend on this expression. There is a unique H such that it must, it must be able to write it like that. And now these functions we were looking for, F, E, whatever, which are obviously the H one, 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 so they can be expressed in terms of symmetric regular functions by what we know about this uh, H minus one. And uh, in addition, as they are so restricted, these symmetric regular functions will be determined by a small part of their coefficients. So in order to determine which ones they are, we only have to be able to assess what these coefficients are. In particular, one check that is there is that if I have a function which is one regular, then if I take the derivative by z, it will be zero regular. And furthermore, if, if this derivative is symmetric, then it is determined just by the part of this function where we put the z equal variable equal to zero. And if we look at how these functions work, you know, if you put the z equal variable equal to zero, <coughs> then this thing will go away because it is only, uh, and basically you only get some polylogs. And so one can easily understand what that is. Okay, and so that is kind of the argument. <laughs> okay, so it's a, uh, but you know, as you can imagine, that was a uh, yeah, uh, rather incredible effort. So uh, okay, so thanks. <laughs>
you have the church then uh, uh, okay, you know, so anyway, so then we can uh, so maybe I can answer that. Because, uh, so it actually works a bit. So I I had mentioned at the beginning this is a special place within the formula for higher rank, which I eventually want to see. So I had some kind of method how to find the conjecture for that. And so finally I dropped I, I worked for a long time and I found the conjecture. And then the special case of that conjecture for uh, the rank one case of the Lucas scheme is this form. And so at this point, I went to uh, Anton and but I knew he had been working on this from another end. So I told him, I know what the answer is, so can you prove it? And so then uh, he kind of uh, came up with this method and then, uh, I mean, I also did some contributions to the actual proof, but, uh, but not, uh, yeah, but the, the main idea uh, of the actual proof is this, but on the other hand, he has this method for many years and he couldn't prove the formula because this method can only prove the formula if you know what the formula is. So, can, can you can I ask a question? I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry? No, we, we hear you, we also have to hear the bell. But anyway. I was gonna now the, the bells are gone, I think. Uh sorry. Um so this omega function is something that we introduced with um Tamash and uh, Emmanuel in our joint work. Uh, and uh, we have a conjecture that this uh, uh, platistic logarithm of omega it gives the Hodge, um, mixed Hodge numbers of the character variety. And some of that is has been proved. So um, by Anton uh, and others. And so I was wondering if, there is any reason why the same omega appears in what you described, uh, other than it seems like uh, the, it just falls in the lap that that's the series to consider, but does it go beyond that? Is there any, what's the expectation as to why this same generating series appears in those two contexts? Well, uh, I mean, I, I think it could be that part of the reason is obviously that Anton worked on the other thing, and so he came up with this thing. No, but but they, but you you told us at the end of the day uh, 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 that the omega was the series that you wanted to compute. I mean, in, in yeah, logarithm right. and so on, it, it specialized yeah. in the in the right way. So it's not. It doesn't seem to be something ad hoc that he happened to know about. It's, so it seems I mean, to be so exactly what you want. Well, you see, it's a bit strange because you know, by itself, you know, this, there's no mystery. Uh, you know, if you look at the formula, the way it's given, uh, it's not that by some complicated, subtle fact, uh, the, uh, the localization formula will give us what we want. It's just obvious. I mean, if you uh, know how to write down such a thing, the formula that I wrote down is precisely this. You know, it's not by some kind of complicated argument. It's just that's, exa that's exactly what I said. It's it's not something that it happened to know about and then br brought into the problem. It seems to be intrinsic to the problem. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So somehow this is, yeah. No, but I mean, I don't think I can answer your question. I mean, so that's uh, maybe I will, I might want to discuss this with Anton whether there's anything one can understand why the same thing works. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's anyway maybe something that uh, we should sometimes discuss. There seem to be very close relations between Hilbert schemes and, uh, and your uh, character variety uh, things, which I don't quite understand. I mean, obviously the Hilbert schemes are related to, to partitions by this localization and to also, but you know, that this, you have the same formulas must have read. And so we maybe should talk about it, but I cannot answer it now. Okay, thank you. Yes. If, if one looks at this formula for omega, there are these powers q to the something t to the something zi. Yeah. Uh, where the something is the arm of the leg length. Oops, well, not quite, but anyway. Yeah. Something to do with the squares of partition. Does that mean that this function satisfies recursion if you replace zi by qzi tzi? So is this something like the q-autonomic system? Oh. 
the one, the perfectly the natural thing. Like we take the simplest thing, product one minus q to the n x, and kind of treat with it to replace x by q x. That series just goes to itself times one minus x. And it's much, much simpler. So it's an inductive. So is there a relation if we take the value of omega with x c1 up to, so with c1 up to ck, and you change, let's say, just c1, either q c1 or t c1, then there should be some simple relation. If so, that might be a much simpler way to understand such points, but it's a question. I have no idea if that's true. No, I don't know. I mean, obviously, what I'm saying. Uh, I don't think I can answer that. So, uh, I mean, uh, they, there is something uh, that is I, I I thought about and didn't make much progress on, but it, this same series, if you specialize in a particular way, the Q and the T um, is related to to uh, representations of a quiver variety. I mean, uh, yeah, of a quiver, a quiver Nakajima variety. And there, there are these functions that uh, correspond to, to a, a, a veil, a veil a group action uh, or some, somehow the, the cat's middle convolution. Uh, and, and those, uh, the the quiver in this in this setting is is a star quiver, so it has one central node and and then legs corresponding to the uh, to the the punctures on the surface, um, and then the, in particular there's an there's a vial group element associated to the central node that does something really complicated to the variables, uh, whereas the 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 the, the vial group elements associated to the legs are, are some simple thing that basically permutes the parts of a partition, so they're not they're not they're visible, uh, and that could conceivably be a pretty serious uh, transformation formula for this omega, um, which I don't know if that done is the kind of thing you're thinking of, but but that's something that um, that has been on the back of my mind uh, as to something to to look into. Sounds much more sophisticated. I just meant it trivially for this formula. Or from the definition, one sees that there's a recursion, a relation between the value at C1 and at QC1 or TC1. But I should maybe look up at that. We should maybe look on forever while. Well. No, but uh, we can, I, you know, we can I can look. It's my turn to say, I don't know. So I, I have, I should look at the statistics, but I, I don't know at least how okay, on top of my head. Okay, so. <laughs> So are there further questions? Otherwise, uh, I'm also exhausted. <laughs> so then- uh, uh, I have one question. Um, okay. I, yes. I hello. Um, so have you tried actually doing any computation for just C2 and not for P2? For C2? Yeah. So like equivariance aggregator lambda. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, so that would amount to- uh, Looking at this thing just like this, you, you take the whole power series, you take the log, and then you do this. And yeah, you get negative the... powers of the weights and positive one, not just the positive like you're getting now. And then it yeah. becomes kind of a mess, right? Yeah, no, I, I have not looked at it. I mean, I don't know whether there's a good, uh, I mean, I, I must admit, I haven't looked at it. Obviously, it would be interesting to say what are the equivariant uh, within the formula of the equivariant. Uh, I mean, that would be an interesting question, but I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it. So, in principle, it's just if you understand this omega completely, then no, I, I don't know. I mean, sorry, but I have not looked at it. Have you done any equivariant computations like that? Um, my, my student is trying to do something like that. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I understand. No, but anyway, we haven't done that. Thank you. Okay, so I think, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm also the chairman, so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> okay, so thanks very much. and. Uh, Okay. So now I. Oh, there were also something in the chat, so I don't know whether. Okay.
But anyway, so I think today. Yeah, well, anyway, somebody asked uh, what we can say about uh, when the surface is singular. And uh, so the answer is we haven't thought about it. And uh, so we, in particular, we can't say at the moment anything about it. Uh, okay, so maybe I will. How do I stop this so that it still registers and all that? So, okay, oh, there's still many people, no? Huh? And it, 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 will, it will save it and all that. So it's also registering, no? Well, it was registering on some cloud, right? Yeah, 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 certainly. Stop so, recording. Oh, there's new in climate, as it seems to be, adding logs.